Welcome to Answer Me 10, the podcast with me, Barbara Dixon. Having been interviewed many times over the years, I'm always conscious of the generic nature of interviewing. And in my case, it usually begins with, so Barbara, tell me, how did it all begin? This has never exactly excited me, but I've always enjoyed reading those one-page affairs at the back of glossy magazines, which ask the same stereotypical questions to different people every week. Hugely diverse answers appear, so I thought it would be fun to pose the same ten questions to some other notable women in the world of music and see what different answers they would give. This is what Answer Me 10 with Barbara Dixon is all about. I hope you enjoy the journey with me. Today's guest is British singer-songwriter Julia Fordham. Growing up on Hailing Island, Julia began to write songs from an early age and began singing in local folk clubs before going on to work as a backing singer for various artists including Kim Wilde and Mari Wilson. Signing to Circa Records in 1988, Julia released her self-titled solo album, which included the hit singles Where Does the Time Go and Happy Ever After. She followed this up with what was to become her most successful album to date, Porcelain. Her biggest hit came in 1992 with the song Love Moves in Mysterious Ways, which was featured in the Hollywood blockbuster the Butcher's Wife, starring Demi Moore. Moving to Los Angeles, Julia took her career in a different direction, working with producer Larry Klein, husband of Joni Mitchell, and continued to release a string of albums. In recent years, she's teamed up with Beverly Craven and Judy Zook, and together they released an album and toured the UK, playing to over 35,000 people. Julia is about to release her latest album, Cutting Room Floor. Question one, town or country? Well, I would say in this current chapter in my life, and I think that's what's interesting about life in general, isn't it? That if you'd asked me that in my 20s, I would have said, town, city, yes, where the action is. I'm trying to get a record deal. I want to go to London. You know, I want to get off Hailing Island. I was sort of so charged in that way. Now I am 100% country, and I actually live um, in a place called Topanga Canyon, which is as romantic as it sounds. I, I mean, I, I pretty much am looking out at the mountains and the trees. I live in a Pickledy pickledy wooden tree house in um, this canyon that's sort of, it's Los Angeles adjacent. It's not really LA that people sort of think of as the Hollywood sign with all the um, hustle and bustle <laughs> that goes with that. It's like people have this joke about British people, which is actually kind of true that when we first come, we all like to flock to Santa Monica. And Santa Monica is a beach city. And I did live there when I was first working here. And I loved it. It's like you come out of your house and turn left and there's the ocean and then you turn right and there's Main Street and all the shops. I have a friend who, who lives in, in Santa Monica, so I know it reasonably well. And it's very true. It's quite British looking, isn't it? It's so British. But the other joke about British people, which also apparently turns out to be true, is that when it comes to trying to start a family and living or putting down roots in L.A., um, we quickly work out that... Uh, it, you know, like a Lego house is 1.6 million in, in, in Santa Monica. So if you want to sort of start a family and, and really become a resident, a lot of British people, and certainly for me, not all, like some sort of prefer the more Hollywood vibe, um, I moved to this option of Topanga Canyon. And it's like, there's no public transport, which was fine when it was just me, but now I have a a daughter who's 16 and all the time that she was growing up, it was an incredible commitment with the driving because it's not even like, I will drop you off at the tube. It's very difficult. I know I used to live in the country here in the UK and uh, we moved into town when my boys were teenagers and the difference, just the freedom of them just being able to go to the shops on their own. So 
I really feel yeah. for you. And um, so you kind of got the best of both worlds. You're, you're not far away from services and things, but you're yes. leafy and green. And you might even, she said very enviously, have a lemon tree in your garden. Well, we have a okay lemon tree, but our neighbours up the road, who rather conveniently, actually just yesterday, they went away on a trip and we had one of our, our new baking hot days and they asked us to go more to the garden. And as a gift, they said, do help yourself to the lemons from our lemon tree. Oh, so I, I love it. <laughs> beautiful <laughs> glorious like bucket of lemons on the table i can't believe it because when i saw a lemon hanging on the tree i said naively and i was in one of the canyons as well the first time i said to somebody that looks just like a lemon <laughs> i didn't yeah. realize it really was a lemon i'd never seen one on a tree it, in they, europe they even <laughs> oh, you're, you're just so exactly the same as me. I mean, I am very much married to the simple pleasure. So I've literally had my nose in our giant glass bowl of lemons. I live with my sister, Claire, and she is a keen gardener. And she has made this extraordinary garden in our Topanga tree house. We call it the serenity spot. <laughs> and it's extraordinary. And we go out. I mean, we're, we're so like every single day. It's like we've never seen it. We're like can you smell that jasmine look at those lemons oh Every I, I, it's beautiful uh, isn't it and it's all about yeah. smells it, it's gardening is i think about smells and certainly when it's very very hot sometimes you don't get smells i mean when it rains that's when you get smells in a garden isn't it well definitely that is true both here and there but we are very blessed i mean literally when i say that we constantly are in awe and wonder of our own living space. We love this yeah. house and Claire's created this beautiful, smelling, looking, peaceful place that, you know, oh. we go out in the morning with our buckets of tea and coffee and, you know. It sounds like you're living in a spa. <laughs> I feel like I'm living in a spa. And I think that's, you know, thanks to my sister, she kind of put the the magic in back into the house because I think that when you go through a, a separation, as I did, um, the house feels that vibration and a bit a piece of it dies, you know, along with you and the dreams of that relationship and family scenario. And then my sister moved in with her husband, who's rather conveniently a marvellous guitar player, who I was in a band with back in the day when the fabulous Mary Wilson, who you interviewed, I heard oh, the Oh, yeah, I love Mary. My She's fabulous. Mary. I love Mary Wilson. And I have, like, you know, a really long relationship with Mary. She's sort of like family in a way. And I don't say that lightly. Like she came <laughs> to the funeral of my father. And we have this history, including the fact that my sister Claire fell in love with the, you know, this is like approximately four million years ago, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, we have this life and this house. And I feel that my sister sort of injected this irresistible country magic into our into our home and life. And it is, I love it. I mean, now I can't even thought bear the thought of being in the hustle and bustle of the city that I so right. craved and enjoyed in my twenties. Question two: meat or veg? Veg, 100%. I've gone officially vegetarian. Again, if I heard Mary's lovely interview that you did, and she mentioned about me and, you know, going veggie at the same time, I then veered back into the, the, the fish world for a while because the father of my child, who I lived with for many years, he's an acupuncturist, uh, acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist and nutritionist. He's an extremely fit, healthy person. And he kept drumming into me that I wasn't having enough protein, he'd have more fish and he'd have more chicken. And I kind of like... When you're seeing somebody who's so vibrantly, radiantly zest-filled and healthy, you're like, well, they must be doing something right. So I switched over. But now that I've been, you know, single and separated for over four years, I've just sort of gone back to more of my own belief system and pace. And I feel that it better than ever. What about recipes? Do you find uh, you you are interested enough in food to do something inventive in vegetarian cooking? If I this is the honest truth, if I was able to, I would never set foot inside the kitchen. I have right. no interest in making food. My sister is a truly gifted creator of food and dishes. I do the washing up, Barbara. That's the deal in this house. 
the kitchen and, porter. <laughs> yeah, Claire, was, do you remember Delia Smith, the cookbook? I remember being about 18 and Claire going, oh, I've discovered this cookbook. And, I, and then she kind of turned out with this like chocolate log and this like amazing roast dinner. And I, Honestly, Julia, that is a fantastic cookbook, How to Eat by Delia. Yes. It's like how to yes. cook. Was that how to cook? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Some, I think I think someone else did once. How, yeah. How to cook. Fantastic. You know, I've still got that book and it's my default setting. Unlike you, I am not a vegetarian, but I right. do actually go into Delia's book. So your sister's right, really, to have got the fundamentals from Delia. Delia is a proper cook. She really is. But Claire has some people have like I like to put all of my creativity into my singing and my writing. Yeah, and, sure. and so even any time when I'm chopping a tomato, I'm like, I should be writing a song. What am I doing? So I'm so blessed now to have this chapter in my life where Claire is like running the eating part of the equation. And she's got that thing where she makes everything like, look like Martha Stewart just dropped by, you know. <laughs> The thing is, in California, because the weather is so warm, you're able to eat a lot of sort of raw foods and whole foods. But in the UK, I mean, in the winter, you, if you're a vegetarian, you're going to be kind of stuck, aren't you, with a lot of sort of root vegetables? I think so. I think the thing is, is that you're right. It's like there's something that's so attractive about the Southern California climate and lifestyle is that a lot of it is it's like those lemons you were talking about. You're in awe. Like, is that a lemon? It's the same. <laughs> there's like an abundance of fruit and vegetables and whole foods. It's so easy to be it radiantly is. healthy here. We've got this on <gasps> table with the south of France and we, we're always, we just live outside in our little tree house. Oh, know? it's so, so lovely. Question three, TV, film, or books? You know, again, it's like the, as life goes on, it changes. I would, use, I would describe myself, myself as someone who used to be very well read. Now, I don't know if it was having a baby really late in life or what it was, but I lost books recently um, in the last few years, but I just rediscovered them. I just listened to my first audio book. I can't recommend it enough. I had yeah, the, everybody audio. says they are a really great thing. Now, I am aware of them. I even did an audio book of my biography, my autobiography. And, and I, but I don't tend to listen to them, but I avidly read. That's so interesting. So what have you listened to? Audio book wise. Well, like, no, you've just said that. I immediately want to hear your life story <laughs> read by you. And what I have learned is that I have no desire to sit down and read it. It happened when um, there was a country Americano singer called Brandy Carlisle. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know Brandy's work that much, but I saw her sing on the Grammys and she sang this phenomenal song called about, it was called The Joke. And I was like, wow, she, she's phenomenal. And then I kept sort of seeing that she had this audio book and I was like, go on then, I'll try it. Hearing somebody's story in their own voice and then singing snippets of things, I was like, this is like a revelation. So you listened to an author reading yes. their own autobiography. Yes. Yes. So you, you haven't that. listened to a novel, say, read by somebody wonderful, but not connected no. with the words. I'm now terribly excited because I followed that up immediately with the Sinead O'Connor audio book. Now, I'm a huge Sinead fan. Like I'm, I've got all the albums. Her voice is phenomenal. I think that she is such a truly interesting and fascinating human, having a very difficult experience here on Earth. That's because she's so she's supernatural and otherworldly, and it's always going to be a tough fit for her. Hearing Sinead tell and sing parts of her story uh, was just so compelling to me. I couldn't move from my bed. How Whereas, interesting. Like, mm. This reading a book lately, even like the Obama, the Barack Obama, I was like, I couldn't wait to get that for Christmas because I thought, this will get me back reading. I'll be the old me. And I was just like, no, I can't. I need to, you know, I can't, I can't read anymore. I don't know what it is. But there's something, if I could recommend anything to anyone who's listening today, if you're thinking about crossing over, the, the narrator being the author 
injects a sort of authenticity that you're never going to get mm. when you read it yourself. Because you're the first of my guests who's talked about audiobooks, actually, because oh. people usually, because of the way it's been the last year and a half, people yeah. usually just launch into their TV and film choices because that's been a great comfort to everybody. And I'm not saying it hasn't been to me, but I am an avid uh, reader as well. I do love to read books. And in the 20 years ago or so, I started to read novels, having read a lot of, of biographies and autobiographies. Now I never read biographies or autobiographies. I don't know if it's my age. I only read novels and I love them. But I'm fascinated to find out that you've been doing this. Do you watch TV and listen to and watch films? Well, I just, this year I had an extraordinary, rather nice timing with the pandemic stuck at home scenario, is that I'm a member of SAG here, so I always get the movies, but that's normally like this treat at Christmas, isn't it? Like, oh, I've got a yeah. screener. Yeah. But somehow this year I was sort of, they say you have been randomly selected. I was randomly selected to be on the nominating committee. I can't tell you, Barbara, how seriously I took that. It went from, you know, like, oh, fun, I'm going to get to see a film at Christmas to... I am being presented with somebody's work yes. that I must see. I watched every single screener and I absolutely loved it because I was approaching it as, in the time of COVID, what a privilege to be watching and looking at what do you really think of the direction, the production, the camera work, the acting. And I mean, I saw some things this, this last year that I just thought were phenomenal. Um, you were watching them critically, but it, that yes. not not negatively, but looking at them with a critical eye. Yes. That that yes. that also is is a first. What would you watch for pleasure if you weren't in well, that position? I think that um, the, for pleasure, the last the last two things that I have absolutely loved on Netflix were both French series. One is Lupin, um, the detective series, and the other yes. is Call My Agent. And um, I think, I don't know why, though, I guess there's something about the European sensibility or the pace that I like. Um, but that I, I absolutely loved both of those. Um, and I just, I'm not a huge TV person. It's, it's quite difficult for me to find something that I can get into. I mean, I do like to watch the um, the week that was with John Oliver, which I like to tape. He's an English guy and he talks really, really fast and he likes to drop F-bombs all the time. And I feel strangely comforted by his commentary on all political things because I'm like, yeah, he's one of my people. I feel like I'm, I'm being, having a slice of British life as I'm lying yeah. on my tapping yeah. in bed. Um, but, you know, I think that also it took up so much headspace watching all those movies and committing to them in a responsible yeah, yes, way. Yes, of course, uh, of course. I didn't have any bandwidth left to really, you know, get into any telly no, stuff. That's fine. Well, we, you've, you've covered that really well and very broadly. Question four, Night Owl or Early Riser? I'm definitely an early riser, really a lot now, because back to sort of the, the reason why, but the space that I'm living in. Um, I think also something to do with having a child late. I was sort of hurtling towards my 43rd birthday when I had a baby. And I'm just like, by nine o'clock, I'm so tired, I can't even. I mean, I also, I'm a doer rather than a beer. And something I'm trying to do in my life is learn how to be. And the pandemic really helped me do that because the first time ever, I was sort of forced to slow down. Yeah, like that's interesting. Going, mm. you know, like going since I was 14 and found yeah. a local folk yeah. and I want to get there and sing my song. And I've actually changed in this last year to somebody who's trying to really sink into the flow of life. So I'm an early person, so I like to... I mean, a bit too early sometimes. Sometimes I'm like, I will not leave this bed until six o'clock. And then when it clicks sick, I'm like, yes, I can get out there. And Claire, my sister's already there with her coffee brewing. And then we sit in our window seat and look at the trees as if we've never seen them before. And I start my day like that. Do you sleep well, Julia? I mean, do you sleep or, or, or is it because you don't sleep very well, you, you get up early? 
Well, I just accept the way that I'm an intermittent sleeper, but I'm fine with that. I can't explain it. Like I've been that way for so long. Again, it right. was like when the baby came at 43, it was just, it's really started then with the sleepless night, but I never toss and turn. I just try and turn my mind into, well, I'll put my fairy lights on and, you know, I, I call it my lays and gaze time where I make myself, you know, just sort of appreciate things or I listen to affirmation tapes. But but I, I, I'm sleeping better again since we've been forced to be in one place. I meet many people who have said this, you know, because there were no deadlines, People just kind of let themselves off. Yes, as a lovely French Canadian friend of mine years ago used to say, you gave yourself the permission. And yeah. and I think we're all the same. I think we've all been the same. We, we've we've had the time to be what we need to be, and the rest of it has just kind of gone to the wall temporarily. And I think a lot of people, most people, are permanently changed by this. I've been permanently changed because I think that we would always be trying to grant ourselves permission to be. Yeah, yeah. And now we were forced. And and it would, people would always be saying, if only I had more time, if only I had more time. Well, it turns out if I have more time, which I've had, I've started to feel sort of quietly fantastic. I can't explain it, really. It's almost sort of like, oh, I always thought if I had time, then I would A, B, and C. And I have done all of those things. Yeah. It's sort of like, yeah. be careful. I know <laughs> exactly what that's right, what that's like. I really understand what you're talking about because I used to fill up all my time. I just filled it up. And it wasn't really full, full up with anything really important in looking back. It's not, I'm not any less uh, bothered mm. or more bothered now than I was three years ago. Yes, I'm almost concerned about sort of stepping back into the real life as what people would refer to. Yeah, as, you know, maybe we shouldn't, normal. Julia. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't. I, I think I've been, I can't. I'm going to graciously step into this unfolding chapter of reflection and not leaning into it. I don't want to lean in. I just want to be sort of perfectly upright or slightly tilted back. I don't mean checking out because I'm very naturally present as a person anyway, but I have had afforded myself the luxury of having this lays and gaze time. I can highly recommend it. Like literally the, the bowl of lemons, I'm not joking. Put your head in there, have a good old stare. Question five, faith or fatalism? I'm 100% faith. I'm a totally faith-based person. I don't need to have proof because I'm always being given proof. That's just too difficult to share because in the few times I've ever tried to explain some of the experiences that have happened to me, it doesn't end well because it just sort of, you know, it just makes you sound like you're a witch. Um, and, and that's not a popular place to be in. Um, I have an abundance, never ending flowing belief that there is a bigger picture. I couldn't frame it for you perfectly to tell you exactly what I think it is. Um, I think that occasionally we can all, and me more recently in these pandemic moments, um, have been able to sort of like literally fall into the flow. So instead of swimming upstream, you actually for a moment can understand how the trees and the birds and the world is vibrating and speaking to itself. And that if you can get into that pulse, which you can normally do by meditation, which is hard to do from all of us, but I have had so many experiences in this sort of down lock timey time that it has literally just confirmed what I've known all along, that there is a force, whether it's, um, something you can influence or not i don't really know like sometimes like you know if you think about something or positive vibrations or things seems can possibly sometimes influence an outcome i think that's the case some of the time but i think that there is a force much stronger i mean an example would be that i follow nasa on instagram and if ever anybody needs confirmation that they're merely just a speck of dust but there is also 
a glorious and abundant wonder in the universe. The stars look up. I mean, it's extraordinary. Brian Cox is doing this series just now where he's looking back on the last 12 years of his making television programs and mm. uh, and, and the, this wonderful astrophysics that he's talking about is just so fantastic. I really, really understand what you're talking about because I've been watching these programs and you do just feel that the wonder of the of the universe and the natural world is so overwhelming. I mean, you do right. you just feel like I can hardly believe that all <laughs> these things have happened. Exactly. And then also that we're not we're not given any tools to be tilted towards the wonder of the universe. We are born into chaos and now we yeah. have more chaos with screen yeah. time and computers and frequency that constantly yeah. keeps us narrowly looking at the smaller picture. So I'm always trying to live in the bigger picture and to have more of the feeling of, you know, there is stardust in me. Just standing back and 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 realizing it and and wondering. I, I think it is very I think you have to give yourself time to wonder. Question six. Facebook or the phone? Okay. Well, I only have a um singer songwriter musician band facebook um i tried to do a facebook for to sort of check in on my family because i wanted to see in england and also my sister her son max lives in fiji and he has these amazing fijian kids and i want to see photos of them um but if i could work out how to actually close that account down i would because we would now have our little you know family whatsapp so i don't need to go to a facebook public yes. page see yeah. those so I have, when the pandemic first started, I felt very compelled to authentically and naturally um, post songs. I wanted to share that. I then had no desire to do it. It ran out. So I just stopped. Lately, I haven't posted anything. So I'm just not feeling it. I'm not somebody who has any, I don't have like small talk or small details. So I never need to know anything chitty chatty. I don't need to know a very small incidental thing that happened to someone. If they want to bring me, you know, something heartfelt, I'm all in. So I, I like Instagram more than Facebook because it's sort of shorter and quicker. And I like to see a little video and a picture of what people are up to. Do you have somebody who does your professional Facebook uh, or looks after that for you? So, or do you do it yourself? I am posting my own things on Facebook and I should yeah. probably do all, but I will because I understand that that's how we talk to people who like yes. us. Yes, and, of course. Uh, I, we everybody, I think, is now agreed that that to communicate now is so much easier than years ago, where you just couldn't do that simply. But now, if you want people to know what you're up to professionally, they can find out with just a press of a button. Do you pick up the phone to hear a loved no. one's voice? Do I, you I look? I don't like chatting. So if I'm going to, I don't I think, I really believe that everything has an energy. So you have an energy and people have an energy. The phone has an energy, the computer has an energy. So I like to really be very careful and guarded about my energy. I, I, I phone my mum, my sister Claire and I, we ring our mum every day. So I have my phone calls to my mum, and that's what I'm doing is I'm checking in on my mum. I'm hearing her voice. I yes. wish that we could you know, yes. to see that she could work out how to do the FaceTime, but she can't, and, you know, yeah. she's 88. That's my voice I'm checking in on. How is my mum? Let her speak. What's happening? She wants yes. to share the details, yes. and I want to listen and tell her what's happening. Yeah. I very seldom ring anyone to chat. Um, I do have my sister who's like my match intellectually and emotionally and basically my person who I'm going to chitter chat with. I have one pal here that I call and then occasionally I'll FaceTime with Beverly Craven and Judy Zook because we're in a band together now and yeah. we, you know, we'll have a little chat about what we're doing next. But it's very, I wouldn't even now, my, I would probably text somebody and said is now a good time to talk i don't think right I would ever just right so you do text you you keep in touch with people probably yes. spontaneously by texting yes. them so that you they yes. know you're thinking of them and vice versa or i do the thing where you leave the voicemail like i have a couple of friends who 
you know, they, they'll, they'll leave a little audio message. One of my sons does that with me. Yeah, exactly. It's I quite like nice, that. isn't it? <laughs> I love that. And I've started doing it back, you know, hello, just letting you know A, B and C. Again, a phone call takes a lot of time. Yeah. And I'm always trying to think of, you know, how do I keep my energy centered to be the best singer or writer I can be. Because the yeah, more that's I'm interesting. Yeah. about that, mm. I might have something that I receive, you know, as a song. Question seven, shower or bath? Hmm. I am, I don't know. I'm a really like no nonsense, get the job done when it comes to the showering or the bath. Um, I walk for, hour every day i'm not like somebody who's I, I was listening you're a runner that's very impressive brother <laughs> i have no desire to break into even a trot i have you know in in my sort of like 20s and 30s i would be you know i was speedy as a person i would always be like running somewhere it was easy but now i would really enjoy that sort of time to walk in nature and we do that every day with the dog claire and i and my sister and then i come back and i'm like Blimey, I got to get on with stuff. So then I'm like in that shower or I literally run the bath and then I jump in as the bath water is running. I have to be a little bit careful about the hot water because there's, it's, it doesn't it have an infinite yes. supply. Yes. In yes. Yeah. That's, in, that's interesting. You, you've hit on several things no one else has mentioned, but the water supply to have a bath is, is inter very interesting. But I also think that because you're in a hot place as well, that a bath isn't quite so luxurious as it is back here. You know, oh, yeah, the, the yeah. probably, you know, you're, you're, you're warm anyway, and you don't need to heat up your bones like we do in Europe all the time. There is that, but there's also, there's a drought here. So there's sort of like something that I would love. I mean, if, if I may be like, twice a year, I would have a ritual bath, you know, with the whole kit and yeah. and, yeah. and but it's difficult to sort of submerge yourself into relaxation in a bath when the other voice in your head is going, you are responsible for the drought in California. <laughs> it's like, you, you know, and relax. It's like, it's hard to be luxurious. Yeah, relaxed. yeah, that is but, so interesting. Well, in Scotland, of course, we have no shortage of water. I think that's going to be right. Scotland's best export after the whiskey very soon. I think you're probably right. And then again, it's sort of like the environment, isn't it? Like the thought of like being in cold, beautiful, stark Scotland and then getting in a bath, that sounds heavenly, you know? Yeah, well, it is, it is because even today I didn't wear a jacket to go out. I had to go out earlier and I was freezing cold. Um, and and I thought, I can I be freezing cold? It's the end of June. But of course, the, <laughs> the heavens laugh at me when I do that in the sea. You live in Scotland. Get over yourself. You know, that's right? There's just no chance. That, you know, that's just the <laughs> not that. at all. Yeah. Question eight: Spring or autumn? Hmm. I think definitely spring because spring is tinged with rebirth and hope. Um, it has a softness and optimism. It's sort of leaning into summer. It's his own marvelous episode isn't it it really is just like bristling with intention that is all going to be good and i just i mean i love the spring and the daffodils again the garden is blooming there's there's just an air and a feel in spring that is almost like you know the the heartbeat of life in a way yeah, it's the rebirth, isn't it? I mean, every yeah. year we look in wonder at these plants coming up and you think, yeah. how can that be happening? And it is, it is miraculous when you think of it. How do you feel about autumn then? How, 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 well, if you prefer spring, do you, does it make you sad to be in autumn? Do you have a birthday then? Do you look forward to Christmas? What, how do you feel? Well, I'm a summer birthday. I'm August the 10th. I'm a Leo. So I'm, I'm a, always had that summer birthday. I um, absolutely love Christmas. I'm also in the part of LA where we are in Topanga. It's not like being in Hollywood or Bel Air or Beverly Hills. 
where it is very, very hot, you don't really get a sense of the seasons. Where we are, you really feel the seasons. It is really cold in autumn. We really get that feeling of like, you know, it's time for the central heating, isn't it? And we have a fire. I have a an open crate in my room. I can have a fire. We have a beautiful um, burner in the front area. And, you know, we're working it with the, the trees that have fallen down because we're in the fire zone here. We're always having to like lop off branches that are touching the house. And then we chop those up. Not me personally, you understand. And then we put them in the fire crate. So I have that experience of like the beautiful leaves that I'm looking at now, beautiful green leaves are going to yellow and orange and tinge and gold and drip and drop. I'm going to be walking on them, crackling. And my sister uh, gathers leaves and twigs and makes these like beautiful um, sort of like these bundles that she then puts beautiful flowers with and then she burns them so it's like we have these like ritual like autumn christmas um so you were talking about the 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 the, the wildfires in in california yeah. and the drought and the fact that there isn't enough water i mean does that doesn't impact on your life at all you're not near where those fires are I'm totally near them. I mean, the last fire that came, I, you know, we, we, we kind of tend to be a bit like relaxed. Like We're, we're like, are we perhaps too relaxed because we can now see the flames from our window? Oh, and wow. I said, like, well, should we now perhaps back up? So we, we're trying to kind of get a bit more serious about it. Um, we are definitely in, when you see, when we makes it to the news, like we're like Malibu adjacent. Uh, you know, all of these places are now in these fire zones. And, yeah. um, and we're one of them. I mean, for example, I, you know, I, my fire insurance just got stopped because nobody will insure any of these houses. Yes, of course, of course. It's, it's, that, it, it's not rocket science, is it? I mean, these guys are in it for the money. Yeah, so there's that we're definitely um, in the fire zone. Question nine, dine out or take out? Both are quite difficult. You're never going to go, oh, I know, I'll drive down the large mountain and get a takeout. I mean, you might, if you're like driving back from, you know, up the hill where the shops are, bring yeah. something back. But there's nothing casual about the choice that we've made in the location of the house. So basically, nobody's going to deliver, even like a Topanga delivery. We'll go, oh, no, 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 no. You're up. Oh, hill. really? <laughs> it re is that how, how far are you from, say, the nearest takeaway then? Well, we don't really have. Um, OK, we're, we're about half an hour from the main shopping area in Woodland Hills. And you might, for example, one day we might say, let's go down to the village. But because again, because of the pandemic, we never got to go out. Um, yeah. I, I Again, because we have this, Claire's such a great cook, for me, I prefer, I'm not really a foodie. If, if it wasn't for Claire and her great cooking skills, I would just have like rice and tofu every night with a bunch of veggies or a salad. Um, we've got this lovely place that we can go inside or out. When I come back to London, which I'm going to be doing in a few weeks, I will be so excited to be like walking out my door and getting on the tube and going out and eating breakfast, press lunch and dinner out. out and what out. would you, what would your favourite, if you had to have a takeaway over here then with all the choices available, what would you like to eat? What would you find was exciting? I think Probably, you know, the, 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 the top class Indian food that we have there. The curries. Um, I mean, yeah, the curries, because I, I do miss that. But if I was here and I was going to pick up a takeout, it would probably be um, Thai food, because at the bottom of our yeah. Topangan Mountain, as it hits the PCH, the Pacific Coast Highway, there's like a Thai place down there. But I'm not really a foodie, and I don't drink either. So it's like... Um, it's not, it's always like the last thing on my mind. It's like, and I don't like, like sitting in restaurants and eating out because it's just so loud, you know, and the thought of like, you know, having been single for so many years, like the thought of like so I'm going out with a bloke on a date and like, oh my God, please, no. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. I won't no. make you do it. I, it's, this no, is not no, I don't want to drink wine. I, don't want I to am not going to make you go out and have a takeaway or sit no. there and wait for a man no. who isn't going to turn up. I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> this is just in a fantasy world. Question 10, high heels or trainers? 
Well, currently um, it's high heels because I'm getting ready for my photo shoot with Beverly Craven and Judy Zook that we're about to do. Um, and I am literally, even before I spoke to you, Barbara, at eight o'clock this morning, I've ordered some new dresses and some new things for our coming <sighs> photo shoot. And I thought, well, I haven't got time to do my walk in my trainers that I do every day. I'll get on my boots, see if they work with my new skirt. So I'm currently in a very high heeled boots. You know, I call them the show business heels. You know, like suddenly you look like you're 10 foot taller and 10 pounds lighter. Are they stilettos? No, I don't. I can never do stilettos. I can do a sort of chunky, funky. You would wear a boot with, with a with a kind yeah. of stacked heel, but high. Stacked. I have been stacked this morning at eight a.m. Bob. Oh, <sighs> stacked I was, and then I'll go to, and I'll toiter down the hallway to make my sister laugh, and she'll go, "Oh, beloved, that's marvelous." Well, it's laugh. amazing, isn't it? How I just said to a, a lot of my girls I've been talking to that none of us have been up in the air on a high heel for so long now that we're all going to look like Dick Emery walking down the road. <laughs> Because it's going to be, it's going to be like that. But, but we, a lot of us also share the love of the sort of stacked heel and the, the boots. You know, I, I think it's good for the leg shape. Some of us have all decided that is a good idea. But it's also part of the the routine of getting ready for the gig. It's like there's a uniform and that you have to have like, like there, there are two me's. There's the one that walks for an hour, hour every day in my Nike trainers yeah. that I, I yeah. fit my foot like a glove, if you will. Yeah. And then yeah. there's this other person that has to kind of do the warm-up exercises with the voice and then also put on the Spanx and put on yeah. the boots and put yeah. on the the thing that makes you become that person. Even in folk clubs in 1972, I used to go into the ladies' loo long before the audience got there and the organiser had just sort of, maybe I was there before the organiser, and I'd go in and I would change my clothes and put a little bit of makeup on for a folk club gig, which didn't very often didn't even have a microphone. Wow. But it was well, this, this psychology of I'm yes. this is a proper show and I am getting paid to do this and I'm going to show respect for myself and my family and my background and also the audience. Exactly correct. It is like we it's like we're not going to turn up in our walking gear. You have to it's an invisible contract between the singer and the audience. And you you have to be elevated in some way. And the, I like that way you just framed it, actually. It was perfect, Barbara, because it is. It's respect for yourself and them. It's like, I get it. This is serious. You've paid. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to prepare my mindset yeah. for the best way that I can it's, share. It's being, a, it's being a performer as opposed to being a singer. It's being right. a performer. It is a performance. People are paying money to see you. You want, you're happy to be there. They're loving the fact you're there. It's the whole kind of nine yards. And that's what I love about it. And I've always taken massive pleasure in getting ready and putting makeup on and stuff like that. And I just become this yeah. other, as, as you just described, this other person. It's like you're preparing for the exchange. And yeah. you can't like, yeah. kind of like flop from one to the other. Yes. And it's this has been so wonderful for me doing Answer Me 10 because my guests, who've all been women, have all had very often a part of the shared experience that I've had as well. And it's been great to get to know people in this way yeah. and find out how they do it. So yeah. you are my furthest away guest of all my yeah. guests thus far, and you've made an enormous effort to, to talk to me today. And it's just great. Now, I hope everything you're going to be doing when you come over is a great success. But thank you so much. And hopefully I'll get to see you soon. Yeah, I'd love to meet you, Barbara. I'd love to come to a gig. I'd love to hear that lovely voice of yours live. I'm sure we can make it happen. And I hope to see you when you come on tour with the girls next year, Julia. And it's been such Thank a you. pleasure to talk to you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Answer Me 10 with me, Barbara Dixon. This podcast was recorded in Edinburgh in 2021 and produced and edited by Lee Noble and John Eden.